quiet silence of a heart that believes itself defeated by loss, by pain, by fear. Our hope nailed to a cross, our own faith depleted at the sight of no movement, a body inert. But it is not the end. At the sound of the gravestone rolling, a new story has unfolded. Death has been defeated. Our hope is alive. Jesus is alive. We raise our hands in victory. By his resurrection, we are set free. He blows a wind of life and brings us back to the light. He is risen. Our Messiah is alive. He breathes and the darkness trembles. He speaks and our future shines. By his sacrifice, we are now saved. By his grace, we can all rise. Here rejoicing in the sky, the grave could not hold him. The veil has been torn. Our Christ has won over death, over sin, over ache. By his power, all chains break. He is victorious. He is the way. He is the resurrection and the life. And by his wounds, we're made alive. Hallelujah. Amen. Fear not, for he is risen. Aren't you glad you serve a risen Lord this morning? Amen. And he is here with us. He has promised wherever two or three would gather together in his name, he'd be in their very midst. So we know that he is present. He's in the house with us this morning. Take your Bibles and turn with you to Matthew chapter 28, a very familiar portion of Scripture for Easter Sunday. Matthew chapter 28, starting with verse 1. After the Sabbath at dawn, on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven, and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat upon it. His countenance was like lightning. His clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. The angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. He has risen just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples he is risen from the dead and going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Now I have told you. Verse 5, one more time. The angel said to the women, do not be afraid. The angel said to the women, do not be afraid. Friends, I never tire of reading this exciting resurrection account. The Gospel of Mark adds to our understanding by telling us that the women had gone to the tomb that morning merely to prepare the body of Jesus for long-term burial. In their minds, it was all over. Regardless of who he is, it's all over. Political reformer, hope of Israel, too late, it's over. Miracle worker, healer, raiser of the dead, he's now dead. Friend that sticketh closer than a brother, he's now gone. The Messiah, the promised one, it's all over. It makes no difference now. We're on the way to the tomb to bury, on the way to prepare for long-term burial, and he is dead. And it's not just hearsay. These women had seen with their very own eyes Jesus' crucifixion and had watched at a distance his dead body being taken down from the cross and placed in a borrowed tomb. What they expected to find and what they found on that Sunday morning are certainly two different things. Now let's go back and take a quick peek at our text one more time. Look at verse 1 where it says, After the Sabbath, at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to the tomb. There was a violent earthquake. For an angel of the Lord had come down from heaven and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat upon it. His countenance was like lightning and his clothes white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook like dead men. 
The angel said to the women, here it is once again now, do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus who is crucified. He is not here. He is risen, just as he said, come and see the place where he lay. Look at that angel's message, kind of phrase by phrase for a moment. First of all, the angel said, do not be afraid. Matter of fact, the angel is saying here, do not be terrified. You know, there are stages of fear. One of them is simply being afraid, and the other is being terrified. And the angel actually said, if you look at it in the original language, do not be terrified. I know that you are looking for Jesus. I know why you have come. He was crucified. He was put to death on the cross, but he is not here. Why do you look for the living amongst the dead? He is risen. He has conquered death, hell, and the grave, just as he promised, just as he said. Now you talk about an exciting turn of events that Sunday morning. The resurrection literally changed everything from that moment on. Hope was reborn. There was no need to fear, not now, not ever, because Jesus is alive and well. Bill and Gloria Gaither, they have a song that says, because he lives, many of you know the words, because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, here it is now, all fear is gone. Because I know he holds the future and life is worth the living just because he lives. What comforting words from the angel that morning, do not be afraid. How thankful I am what was true for the women that morning is also true for us this morning as well. I want you to consider with me for the next few minutes now how the resurrection of Jesus Christ affects our daily lives as Christians. First of all, because of the resurrection, we need not fear life. You know those friends that get up every day and they fear the day? They fear living out the next 24 hours? You know, there's a singular message that Jesus had time and time again for each and every one of his disciples as he would greet them in what is called post-resurrection appearances. That is his appearance to his disciples following his resurrection. And the message that he had each and every time was fear not. Because upon seeing him, there was a certain fear inside of them, wondering, what has happened? Is this really the same Jesus that we walked with, that we had seen in, uh, in so many days of our lives and situations? But now, it goes without saying, at least in part, that he's addressing their natural fear, seeing him alive once again. I was thinking back a few years ago, when I lived on Dana Court in Milwaukee, my next door neighbor was a young 30-some year old. He was a young guy that was hardworking, loved his family, gave his best to all that uh, he could do in life. And uh, he contracted a very serious form of cancer. And that ca cancer just day by day, just slowly but surely, ate up his very life and he died. And uh, the funeral was on a day that we had many responsibilities at our own church. We were unable to go to the funeral, so I did not have a chance at that moment to meet his extended family or his family at all. And uh, though we ministered to his wife living next door to us, I had never met the rest of the family. A few months after the funeral, I was at uh, one of the malls here in Milwaukee. And as I was going into one of the stores, I met this guy. He had a twin brother, and this twin brother was identical. And when I saw him, I didn't know whether I should go up and hug him or whether I should run for life. <laughs> the disciples, many of them thought that they had seen a ghost, others some kind of an aberration, and they were unmistakably shaken and they were fearful. And so Jesus' message to them over and over was simply, you do not need to fear this moment. Your eyes are not deceiving you. It is I. Furthermore, you will never need to fear because just as I have been with you prior to death and resurrection, I will be with you always. Matter of fact, Jesus said, I will never leave you and I will never forsake you. 
He says at the very end of his commissioning in Matthew chapter 28, he says, lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. He said, you need not worry. There will not be one moment of your life that I will not be with you. Friends, I'm so glad that we don't have to do life alone. How about you this morning? Aren't you glad to know the risen Lord is with us? And he says to us, as the angel said to the women that day, do not be afraid, he is risen. Your life can often be challenging and difficult, but it is so good to know that we will never walk alone. When John was banished to the Isle of Patmos, he was put out on this desert kind of island to die. It was a place where the Romans would send their prisoners that they never wanted to see again. It was kind of the Alcatraz of the day. And he was out on this island. He was banished just because he loved God and he preached Jesus Christ. But on the island, even though he was far from all other persons, Jesus was there. When Paul and Silas were beaten, we read about in the book of Acts, and thrown into jail for the cause of Christ, Jesus was with them there in that jail cell. When Martin Luther nailed the 95 Thesis to the Wittenberg door, Jesus was there. When I stood alongside the caskets of my mother, my father, my brother, and three of my sister-in-laws, each and every time, Jesus was there. Jesus perfectly fulfills every Old Testament promise. The promise that he would be unfailing with us and his presence would be with us at all times. Look at Isaiah chapter 43. Isaiah chapter 43 and verse 1. Now this is written 700 years before Jesus was born. And here's what it says. But now thus saith the Lord that created thee, O Jacob, and he that formed the O Israel. Isn't it good to know we have a father that knows us? And the Bible says this, fear not. Fear not, for I have redeemed thee. I have called thee by thy name. Thou art mine. Isn't it good to know he knows our name? He knows where we're at. He knows what's going on. Listen to the promise now in verse 2. When thou passest through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow you. When thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burned, and neither shall the flame kindle upon you. Notice here he says, fear not. Fear not, I've redeemed thee. I bought you back. You're mine. I know you by name. I know the number of hairs upon your head. And you will never be alone. Look at Psalm 46. The Bible says, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. So where is God when we're in trouble? He is with us. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth be removed. Now, if you got up in the morning, put your feet over the side of the bed, and you discovered that while you were sleeping that night, the earth disappeared. That's a biggie, right? Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth be removed. The most wild of circumstances you might think of, the world being taken away. The psalmist says, therefore, we will not fear, though the earth be removed, and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, and though the waters roar thereof and be troubled, and though the mountains shake with the swelling thereof. Just think about it. The word selah, when you see that in the Psalms, it means just pause for a moment and think about what was just said. In Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6, It says, trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not on thine own understanding. And in all of thy ways acknowledge him and he will direct your paths. Friends, I'm so glad that in Jesus we find our purpose, we find our provision, we find our protection, and we find our direction. And he's promised he will never leave us. He will never abandon us. And because of the resurrection, we need not fear life. We'll never walk alone. Secondly, because of the resurrection, we need not fear death. So first of all, we need not fear life. And secondly, we need not fear death. You know, ever since the fall of Adam and Eve, death has been one of those cold, hard facts of life. Like sand through an hourglass, our days swiftly pass by. The Bible declares that our natural lifespan is somewhere between 70 and 80 years is what the Bible tells us. I checked that out last night by simply, you know, when you don't know what to do or who to ask, you go to Siri, right? 
And so I asked Siri, I said, Siri, what is the average lifespan here in the United States of America in this year of 2024? And the newest stats that Siri could give me was for 2023, but here it is. In the United States of America, the average lifespan is 76.1 years. Now, if you break that down by gender, women, they live 79.1 years, men 73.2 years. And when you average it out, it's the 76.1. Matter of fact, since COVID, the average person lives one year less than they did prior to 2020, not only here in the United States, but around the world. So no matter how you cut it, life is short. 70, 80 years of life, and if you're to live to be as long as my mother did, 100, no matter how long it is, it's not much time to somehow squeeze all that you want to do, all you want to accomplish, everything you want out of life into 70 to 80 or even 100 years. And how depressing it would be if this short life was all there is. And when it would be over, it's over, and it's over forever. You know, psychologists, they tell us that the fear of death is the basis of all fears of life. For example, the fear of heights, or the fear of flying, or the fear of water, or of scores of other phobias. The root of every fear of every phobia at root is the fear of death. Why is it that they fear water? They fear that if they were to be out in the ocean and they're swimming in the ocean and uh, they get caught in a riptide, they're gonna be taken out to sea and they're going to die. Why are they afraid of flying? Because if the plane goes down or the ship goes down and the Bible tells us that there's a fear and this fear is this fear of death. And this fear of death, actually, Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 14 and 15 talks about it. Listen to what it says. For as much then as children are partakers of flesh and blood, that's who we are. We're flesh, we're blood, and of course we're made up of spirit as well. We're body, soul, and spirit. For as much then as children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also, that is Jesus, likewise took part of the same. He became like we are so that he might understand what it's like to live here on this planet. And so he himself likewise took part of the same, that is flesh and blood, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver them who th fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. You know, there's a bondage when you fear things, and especially when you fear death. You can't enjoy the day because you're fearing what might happen later. You can't enjoy flying because you have a fear of, if the plane goes down, of dying. You have a fear of this phobia, of that phobia. Friends, because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, we need not fear death. Hallelujah. <laughs> psalm 23, a psalm that many of us know and maybe even memorize as small children on. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, come on, what's the next phrase? I will fear no evil. Why? For thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff do comfort me. Hallelujah. We need not fear death. Now in John chapter 14, Jesus was preparing his disciples for the day that they would see him crucified and wanting them to know that do not consider that to be the end, but on the third day I rise again. But in John chapter 14, starting with verse 1, he is now preparing them and preparing us so that we can understand the sequence and what happens at death. He says, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. So Jesus wanted them to know that when he ascends back to heaven, he was going to go and begin to prepare a place so that we might spend all of eternity unending with him. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. 
And whether I go, you know, and the way you know. And Thomas saith unto him, Lord, we know not whether thou goest, and how can we know the way? And Jesus said unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Then in John chapter 14, just a few verses later than this, Jesus declared, because I live, you shall live also. He said, I want you to understand, when you see the crucifixion, that will not be the end. He said, I want you to know, on three days, I'll be raised back to life. And just as my resurrection is going to bring me back to life, my resurrection is going to bring you back to life one day as well. It was in John chapter 11, to a brokenhearted Mary and Martha, that Jesus said, I am the resurrection, the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. Then Jesus, he turned to the tomb of Lazarus, and he shouted out, the Bible says in a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And the Bible says that Lazarus came forth out of that grave. The resurrection of Lazarus was just a small, very small foretaste of what is to come. Listen to what is yet to take place. 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 13 through 18. Paul writes and he says, But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep. Now this word sleep here is really, and if you look at other translations, is talking about death. Concerning them which have died, that you sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. The one that sorrows the greatest and the longest is the one that has no hope. And so he says, I do not want you to sorrow like you have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died, how many believe Jesus died? How many believe that Jesus rose again? That, that deserves a little hoot, all right? That's the original Greek, all right, hoot. For if you believe that Jesus died, and we believe it, and rose again, we believe it, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. Listen to what's going to happen. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord. It's not something Paul said I made up. This comes directly from the Lord. That we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. Here's the sequence, verse 16. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with a yahoo, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, he said, I want you to comfort one another with these words. The Apostle Paul later on says, to live is Christ, to die is gain. To live like Christ, no matter how good life is here, if you live with Jesus and you allow him to be the guide and the Lord of your life, he says, I want you to understand, to live is Christ, to die is gain, not loss. He also goes on to say, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And so when we die as Christians, we can know instantaneously to be present with the Lord is our promise from our Lord himself. Now, because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ then, friends, we need not fear death. Not long ago, I read a, a little piece and someone said, they have finally found the cure for death. Jesus. <laughs> Isn't that good? We have found the cure for death. It's Jesus. There's more to life. There's more than the 70 to 80 years that we spend in these mortal bodies. There's an eternity full of more. Because of the resurrection, we don't have to fear life. Because of the resurrection, we do not have to fear death. And thirdly, because of the resurrection, we need not fear judgment. Now in Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 27 it says, And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this comes the, say it with me, the judgment, right? And it is appointed unto men once to die, and then comes the judgment. You know, appointments. 
You know, some of the appointments of life that we have really wanted uh, nothing to do with, you know, it may have been, you know, a doctor's appointment, a, an appointment with somebody that, you know, we, we you know, really were uh, very agitated about having to go through it and be with them in this particular appointment. And, you know, sometimes we weasel our ways out of an appointment, but this one we won't. The Bible says, it's appointed unto man once to die, but after this comes the what? Say it one more time. The judgment. Now in Revelation chapter 20, verses 12 and 13, we find here the Apostle John giving us a little further picture of all of this. Here's what he said. And I saw the dead, small and great. Now when he says small and great, he's not talking about stature, you know, short people, tall people, you know, all of this. He saw the dead, small and great. He is speaking of whether they were a king on earth, whether they were a president, a vice president, they were a senator. They had some position on earth where in the eyes of men we would consider them, they were great. He said, I saw the great stand before God, but I also saw the small. I saw those that got up every day and nobody really knew who they were or how important they were. They just went about their daily jobs. They had no names that would ever be in, in limelight. He said, I saw the small, the one you might think is insignificant, but not in the eyes of God, and the great, the one that would be too great to stand in the presence of God. He said, I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is called the Book of Life. And the dead were judged out of those things which are written in the books according to their works. Now listen here, the verse 13 says, no matter where they were buried, no matter what system they used to bury them, they were still going to have to come and stand before God. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it. And death and hell delivered up their dead which were in them. And they were judged, every man according to their works. Now friends, there's not many issues that all major religions agree upon. Matter of fact, there's hardly anything all the major religions agree upon. However, interestingly enough, when it comes to the subject of a coming day of judgment and reckoning, they all seem to agree that one day everyone will have to give an account of their life to a higher being. You know, the Egyptians, going all the way back into antiquity, the Egyptians taught that they would be judged by Anubis, on the basis of their own merit and of their deeds. Anubis was half man and half jackal. Those of you that are familiar with Egyptian art, you'll often see this jackal head on the base of, of you know, various kind of bodies below, but nonetheless, this head of the jackal on, on the top. And he's there alongside of these balances, and on the balances, when a person died, they believed in, in, you know, in Egypt that their heart would be placed on, on the balance scale. And the balance had to always go on the side of good because your works and your deeds had to be good. But if you didn't measure up, the Egyptians taught that standing right alongside of it was Amit. Amit was a being with the head of a crocodile and the base of it was various other animals below it. But he was waiting there by the balances as men were being judged, and if they were not up to the standards, they would leap upon that heart, this amet, and would devour the heart and devour the soul of that individual. The Hindus, they believe they're going to be judged by Yama, the god of the dead. Buddhism, Islam, Judaism, they all believe in a coming day of judgment based upon one's own merit. Now, friends, here's where Christianity steps away from the rest of the crowd. As committed followers of Jesus Christ, listen to this, we will not be judged on our own merit. And that's mighty good news. And here is why it's especially good news. 
because Romans chapter 3 and verse 23 tells us all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Romans 6 and verse 23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now I want you to see how long before we ever came to Christ, He saw value in us, and He was prepared and ready to do everything He could to draw us unto Himself so that we might have life and have it eternal. Romans chapter 5, verses 6 through 9 says this, for when we were yet without strength, meaning at a point where we could do nothing to save ourselves, understanding that we had fallen short of the glory of God, we've already sinned, and it's already too late to say, I'll never do it. For when we were yet without strength, we couldn't help ourselves. In due time, at the perfect moment, Christ died for the ungodly. Look at verse 7. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet preventure for a good man some would even dare to die. There are some of us in this room that we might be willing to die for, our husband, our wife, our sons, our daughters. We might be willing to take a bullet for somebody else, but that list would be very, very short. It tells us in verse 9, however, but God commanded his love towards us, and that while we were yet sinners, while we were all messed up, Christ died for us. Much more than now being justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 21. It says, For he hath made him, that is Jesus, to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Fear not. Fear not, for he is risen. Fear not. Because of the resurrection, we need not fear life. We don't have to fear what tomorrow holds. We need not fear death. We need not fear judgment. That has already taken place. Jesus took that judgment for us. And he loves us. He cares about us. And in the midst of a crazy world like we live in this morning, how grateful I am for those words, fear not. Fear not. Once again, this past week, a six-year-old boy is in his own home, sitting on the floor. You know the story, it's been on all the news. Playing the last game of the night on, you know, his, his electronic game, whatever it was he was playing. Mom said, come, let's quickly go over to the bedroom here. We're gonna read a book before we close out the night. And a shot rang out. Some poor people live in, well, I would call nothing short of a a war zone. The little boy didn't follow. He had been shot in his own home as that bullet pierced the side of their wall of their home. Now, thank God he's going to be okay, they say. How many of you have read or seen or have a loved one that's lost their life with the crazy driving in our city, stolen vehicles, racing away from authorities, hitting and killing innocent people. It's a crazy world. I'm so glad I don't have to fear life. I don't have to fear. He is with us. He's for us. And he said, I'll never abandon you. And that's why he spells out, even in the darkest of times, when you go through the deep waters, when you go through the fires of affliction, when you go through junk, you go through hardship, I'll be with you. I'll sustain you. You won't go alone. If he were dead, that promise would mean absolutely nothing but he's alive. And because he's alive, he says, fear not. We don't have to fear life. We don't have to fear death. Because we know that there's a whole eternity full of more with our God. And that death does not have the sting. Jesus took it out. Somebody said that it's kind of like a bee, a bee that would 
be buzzing around you and all of us that have lived, you know, any length of time at all. We've probably been stung by a bee a, a time or two during our lifetime. But it would be like a bee flying around you, but Jesus took the stinger out. He can buzz. He might cause a little bit of consternation, but he cannot harm. Death cannot harm. Because Jesus took all the sting away. We don't have fear of death. And we don't have to fear. We don't have to fear the judgment. The great and small. No one's so great that they can avoid it. Nobody's so small that they don't have to. The Bible says all will stand before God and have to give an account of what they've done in their, their lives and their bodies. I'm so glad in that moment. Can you imagine standing before the God of all the universe, the one that says, let there be light and there's light, the one that creates life, the one that's all-knowing, all-powerful, to stand before God and have Jesus come up along and say, Father, he's okay. This one's mine. This one has accepted my completed work at Calvary. I died for him. He accepted that. And we walk together. And the Father will say, well done, enter thou in. But in that moment, and again, I remind you, all world religions, regardless of how, how bizarre some of their thoughts are, they all believe that there's a coming day that everyone will have to stand before God. And I'm so glad that in that hour, we don't have to worry about it because of Jesus Christ. If you don't have that assurance this morning, you can have it. Will you bow your heads, Father? Lord, we're so grateful that you love us with an everlasting love. So grateful for that promise. You said, I'll never leave you, never forsake you. The promise that when you go through the, the deep waters, that's troubles, through fire, that's even hot fire trials, I'll be with you. He said, I know you by name. He said, you're, you're mine. Lord, I pray that, Lord, we've all made that decision to make you the Lord of our life, to be determined that we're going to walk with you. We're going to live in the benefits of the resurrection, not fearing life, not fearing death, not fearing coming judgment. Thank you, Lord, for the peace of God that passes all human understanding that we can have no matter what's going on in this crazy world round about us, we don't have to fear life. Thank you, Lord. Even though it's three score and 10, 70 to 80 years, we don't have to fear death. You've got a plan for us. And you said, I am the resurrection, the life. And we find our hope in your resurrection, Lord. And so, Lord, I pray today, Lord, for men and women that are in this room right now, they're saying, I'm not sure where I'd spend eternity. I know that I, I can't avoid, I can avoid some appointments in life. I've been able to weasel out of them. But I know there's one that's coming. It's pointed on man wants to die, then comes the judgment. And I don't want to stand there alone. I don't want to stand on my own merits because I have to be honest with myself. I know I've sinned and fallen short. Lord, you're the only one that can forgive sin. And I pray, Lord, these next few moments be transforming. With heads bowed and eyes closed, how many would say, Pastor, as you close out your prayer this morning, I want to give my life to Jesus. I want to know what it means to, to be forgiven. I want to be able to live my life without fear of of life, death, or judgment. And I know it only comes out of relationship with Jesus Christ. Will you include me in your prayer this morning as you pray? Let me just see your hands with heads bowed and eyes closed. Hands all over this room are going up. That's right. You say, yes, Jesus. Yes, Lord. Thank you for being so honest this morning. You may put your hands down. 
as I pray this prayer, I want you just, I want you to whisper this from your own heart. Just say, Jesus, thank you for coming on a journey to this world to redeem. The Bible says you've come to seek and to save the lost. Thank you, Lord, for seeking me out. Lord, I ask for forgiveness. Forgiveness for my sin. Forgiveness for my stubbornness. Forgiveness for all the times you've knocked at my heart's door and I've just kind of allowed the door to remain shut. This morning I'm opening my heart to you, Lord. I'm inviting you to come in. I ask you to forgive all of my past. Take your rightful place upon the throne of my heart. Thank you, Lord, for hearing me as I've prayed this prayer. Thank you, Lord, for the resurrection, which gives me absolute confidence. Everything you promised has always come to pass. And so will be my forgiveness and salvation. Thank you, Lord, that I can trust you, that you'll never leave me, you'll never forsake me. Whether it's on the mountaintop or in the valley, you're with me, you're for me. And I thank you, Lord, for hearing me as I pray. And I believe, oh God, that in all things, you've got a wonderful future for me. And I'm excited to know that I can live a faithful life in Jesus' name. Can we welcome into the kingdom of God, the family of God, those who just prayed that prayer from their own heart this morning? Welcome. I have a gift for you this morning, and uh, this gift is called The Next Steps. On the inside, there's a booklet written by Dr. Billy Graham many years ago. He gave it out by the millions all over the world at his crusades where men and women came to Christ because he wanted them to know, how do you know the Lord? How do you know Christ? How do you walk? How do you establish your faith? And it's my gift to you this morning. What I'm gonna do, I'm gonna come down on the floor at the close. There's not gonna be a long conversation. I'm simply wanting to give you this gift this morning. No strings attached to it. I wanna help you get started on your Christian walk, your Christian life. And so we're going to be on the floor and I'll make sure that everyone that would like to have a copy, you're saying, I, I want to grow in Christ. I don't want it to stop here on, on Easter Sunday. I want it to be Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and for the rest of my life. I want to know how to serve Him, how to follow Him. Next Sunday, we're starting a brand new series on grace, the gift that keeps on giving. And I believe that it's going to be so insightful and so helpful that we talk about the wonderful, amazing grace of God and so we'll start a brand new series next Sunday morning. Let's all stand together as we uh, close out this service today, as we begin to sing that chorus together. Lead us on, if you will, please.